All right, so we're going to get our giving ready. As If you're watching online, you can give online as well. Uh, let's get our tithes and offering together. Um, just a testimony real quick. Uh, so the, I know I've, uh, I was supposed to become a team lead, but I ended up failing the test the first time, and I went and prayed and took it again, and I ended up passing it again, so Lord willing, I'll be back up front dealing with that, and uh, I'm a newlywed, I'm married to Abigail, those of you that don't know, I'm married to my sweetheart, and God is really working on us too, and I appreciate uh, Apostle taking the time and mentoring us as we're growing in God, and uh, Wednesday nights, I'm excited to be here on Wednesday nights, and what he's been teaching has really helped us out financially, and what we do, and we always make sure we have our tithes before anything else. Good. So let's go ahead and get our tithes and offering, and we're going to bless it. But no, Wednesdays and Sundays, if you can make it Sundays as well, I would advise you to be here because Sunday nights have been, Sunday mornings have been really good. And, uh, if you can, come out Friday night to prayer, because last Friday, oh my word, we had a time in prayer. God really moved Friday night. So if you can, at 7 o'clock, make it Friday night. Join us as we gather in prayer. So. If you're watching online, there's a giving button that says my offering. You can go there and give as well. So, uh, okay. uh, don't forget, no Sunday nights this coming Sunday, Mother's Day. So go home, spend time with your mothers. So if you'll stretch your hands towards the giving, we're going to bless the giving. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we lift up our tithes and offerings, Lord God. God, you know our hearts and what we need, Father. We ask that you would take this tithes and offering and double it in blessings, Father. That you would bless our financial situations, that you would bless our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. Yeah, Sister Tony. Uh huh. Okay. What's her name? It's all right. What's the grandbaby's name? Royalty. Heavenly Father, we lift up Royalty's grandmother right now. We command these seizures to stop, God, as she gets clean, God. We ask, God, the Holy Spirit would help her. We command all these toxins to come out of her body. We command everything to line up with the Word of God the way that you intended. We thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit power that is creative. And, God, that you can help us in every situation. Be there every step for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah, Shelby and Jordan, they're, they're staying in a temporary place down by mom and dad, down by Shakota. But they're wanting a house up here, a place to be. Amen. So let's lift them up. And I know um, also uh, Trevor back there, he's looking for a place. Amen. So let's lift up all of these people in transition. Heavenly Father, we lift up Jordan and Shelby right now. I thank you, God, that you open up the door, God, and God, that, that you would accomplish in their family what you want accomplished while they're down there with Shelby's father, with her and Jordan getting closer, God, and Zayden. Heavenly Father, I also thank you, God, for Trevor. 
God for accomplishing in him what you've desired to accomplish, God. That deep relationship and trust. God, I just want to thank you, God, that we can trust you. God, we wait upon you, God. We wait upon you. We serve you, God, while we are waiting for things to, to, to move forward. And God, we thank you, God. You open the door you want to open. Close the doors you want closed so that we can follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we ask God that you would touch Judy's family, God, those that are still here. We ask God that you would move over them, God, and bring them comfort in their time of bereavement. And God, we thank you, God. The Holy Spirit goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. More prayer requests? Huh? Amen. Praying that. Lord, we thank you, God, for Tony's family. Yes. dear joy heavenly father we ask god that joy would take care of herself we ask god right now god that you would begin to show her what to do god to cleanse her body god we thank you god for healing over her life god and god we thank you god for tony's family god in this time of agreement you touch all of them and god that these deaths would stop right now in the name of jesus god god that they would wake up to you and they would follow you like never before in jesus name Heavenly Father, we ask God he'd come out of this coma. We ask God you move by your power, God. Open him up right now. Let him find you, God, while he's under. And let him come out, God, gloriously saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and set on fire for your will. We thank you, God, right now for opening him up, God. Any, anything that happened to him or anything in his body, we command it to be healed in Jesus' name. Sister Shirley. Surely you're prophetic. If the water floods your land, that means the Holy Ghost is flooding you. Hallelujah. God's good. Hallelujah. It's all how you take it. Amen. God is good. But we're going to begin to go into early church history, and we're going to begin to get some understanding because you can't study it without also getting understanding of, of progress and what God is saying and what God is doing. Um, some of the in individuals we'll be studying you may not know about. Um, it's because... Uh, we all know about people in our day, but we don't necessarily really know what God is wanting to do or how he founded things or how he started them, amen? And so one of the books, um, this is a really good book. I found it after I had done a bunch of study. It is a good book called Getting to Know the Church Fathers, and um, it tells some of the similar things that I found in my studies. Um, I have these up here. If you want one, um, you can come see me. I think they're $12 or something. I have three of them. Um, if you want me to order some more, I can. I don't know that they'll be $12. I don't know what they are now. But um, these are really good books. Or if you'd like to check one out and bring it back and let somebody else read it, you can do that too, okay? And so <clears throat> however you want want to do that. Um, so we're going to go in this study. I need someone to hand this out. Yeah, Bernie. Hand this one out for me. And hand this one out. Yeah, just one person. 
family or individual, whatever we talked about. I got 25 friends. <clears throat> and so it's very, very important um, that we really understand because we are so, so, um, how do I put this? We are so, so light on doctrine in our time. And doctrine, meaning understanding what God is saying, people make light of it. They all think that they can just flip anything around the way that they want. And it's been happening over a long time. And so when you get in early church history, you understand that this was very, very important. Um, this course is going to take you through the history and establishment of the early church from the death of Jesus Christ to 500 A.D. And the closer you get to the original teachings and founding of the church, the more agreement you're going to find in Scripture. Um, the study will give you knowledge of the early congregational founders and the overseers. It deals with various doctrines that threaten the actual gospel of Jesus Christ. And the majority of these doctrines are still in existence today. Nothing new under the sun. Same thing, different name. Okay? You might call it a different type of doctrine or a different name. And so we're going to start here on the one that uh, says a study of church history. And we're going to start by understanding uh, the various outcomes of a lot of the apostles and disciples that, found, uh, that follow Jesus. We have some records in Scripture. You have your Bible handy. I want you to have it pulled up um, so that you can read it for me. Um, who has their Bible wants to go ahead and get Mark 6, 16 through 30? I need somebody else to get Matthew 27. And I need to get have somebody else get Acts 12, 1 through 2. Whoever the first person is, Mark 6, 16 through 30. Who has that one? Okay, Trevor, get that one. And then um, we have Matthew 27, 5. Okay. Then we have Acts 12, 1 through 2. Who wants to get Matthew 27, 5 for me? Okay, Tony. Anybody want to get Acts 12, 1 through 2? Okay, you get that. Acts 12, 1 through 2, yes. And um, so when we get into the history of church history, there's things in your Bible that are listed for sure, and then we have oral tradition of the early church, and you would not believe the amount of writings there is. And the problem is, is to differentiate between writings that her, were heretical, uh, which means they were written to boost some man up or raise some man up and then the original intent of the Bible or the apostles what they said or what spirit they were in and uh, so at the same time Gerald we have all these people men and women of God fulfilling God's plan and understand any time that God's plan begins to fulfill Satan always has an imitation he has an imitation of everything so when we talk there is God's real grace. Everybody say grace. And then there is a grace in our day that requires no change. It's not real. Because God is not going to leave you in the same condition he found you. Otherwise, the prodigal would be left in the mud. Right? Or God would have never pulled David out of hell. Or pulled him out of the pit. So, see, when you get into doctrine and different doctrinal things, you have to understand when it gets out of context, it won't let the word take people where they want to go, where God wants them to go. It leaves them in some sort of condition. It stops. For instance, um, I believe in praying to God. I believe in God. But I will tell you that when man gets a hold of certain things, like the sinner's prayer, anybody ever heard of that one? Okay. There are people that really repent and really love God. But then if you just say the sinner's prayer in five minutes and, and declare someone that they're on their way to heaven, the problem with that is you're acting like their relationship with Jesus has to be this long. And they're already there because they said the prayer. No, no, no. Relationship with Jesus is much farther than the beginning of a relationship. And that's where, like, pastors and stuff, we've got to understand. It's a very dangerous thing for me to declare someone saved. I can know you by your fruit. Everybody say, I know you by your fruit. 
but I cannot eternally secure your salvation. That's between you and Christ, Jesus Christ. So when preachers say things like that, so somebody just got saved. What they're really trying to say is someone started a relationship with God. Or let's say I come over here to Brother Tim and I say, Brother Tim, are you saved? Right? What I'm really saying is this. How's your relationship with God right now? Right? Because they that endured to the end shall be what? Saved. We, we may, uh, is my relationship with God right now? Am, am I in right standing with God? If I die, you'll hear preachers say, if you die tonight, would you go to heaven? Right? What they're saying is, how's your relationship with God? Are you in good standing? If you breathed your last breath, would, would you feel like you were in a relationship with God? Right? Then we have extremists on the other side, Chris, that say that, that well, if you commit one sin 30 minutes before, like you over ate, 30 minutes before and you didn't repent of that, you'll go straight to hell. Well, that's not true either. Amen? Because God looks at our heart even though some things we do have consequences in the flesh. So it's balancing these things out. So we're going to start by going through the life of Jesus and the apostles. We'll see how much you can take of this tonight. Amen. Did you get papers, Tim? Okay, good. So, Jesus was born somewhere around 6 B.C. and, um, and died 33 A.D. I know we like to start it at zero before it was before Christ. Now, they, now they've even changed these meanings of B.C., A.D., all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, uh, they flip them all around, around and that kind of thing. But... Around 6 B.C., these are estimates, to 33 A.D. was Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, let's see what happened to him. Mark 6, 16 through 30. Can you stand and read that for me, Trevor? Just read it loud and bold. Later on, we find out that Herod's eaten by worms. Okay, right there, dies in front of everybody, and he was eaten by worms. Uh, so we know what happened to John the Baptist and this type of uh, a thing. This girl, mo the girl's mother wanted his head chopped off, and so he lost his head for the sake of the gospel. The Bible mentions the death of the uh, two of the original apostles, um, Judas, Matthew 27, 5. Whoever has that one, I think it's Sister Tony. So 
Judas hanged himself because um, he, he went to the priest for repentance and it meant to feel sorry for yourself. And um, uh, so he felt sorry for himself, but he didn't have true, re true repentance. It, true repentance means to consider what you should be or can be. Okay? Repentance, worldly repentance is saying, I'm sorry, feeling bad about yourself. God's repentance says, I've got to rethink about what I can be. Okay? I'm sorry, God, but what am I supposed to be doing? I'm sorry, God, but where am I going? And Judas didn't receive that. He received the repentance of religion. And so the next one, James, son of Zebedee, um, Acts 12, 1 through 2. Yes, go ahead, Sister Shannon. Amen. So we see that James died again by Herod, killing him with a sword. All of these men end up dying for the faith. They're dying for the faith. And when we get over here, we begin to go to written tradition or church tradition to find out what happened to each disciple or apostle. And you can find that written in history. And the whole thing is, is that they begin to spread the gospel different places and different church history happens. There's some things here that you need to understand that are true and some things are not true because as we go down history, people can distort things for their own benefit. Just like with Peter, and I'll hit this in a minute. Peter worked among the Jews before he eventually reached Rome. Peter's home church um, was, was Jerusalem, where he, traditionally, where he was traditionally the first bishop. Um, there's no account that ever says Peter was the bishop of the Church of Rome. But the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church made him the bishop of the Church of Rome. And by the way, the Pope is supposed to be his replacement. Okay? And they actually believed um, the scripture where Jesus told Peter, up on this rock, I will build my church. They believe the church is built on Peter. That is not the rock that he was talking about. Peter got the revelation that Jesus was God. Right before that, and he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The revelation you just received, Peter, that I am the Christ, I am God. But the Roman Catholics, they, they base a lot of stuff on a man. Um, he preached in Judea, Antioch, and certain parts of Asia. And then he went to Rome, where he was crucified upside down by Nero. And thus he ascended to the eternal habitations in 67 AD. Along with the Apostle Paul, he may have been executed during the persecutions of Emperor Nero. Apparently he was crucified head down at his own request. Later, tradition claims that St. Peter's in Rome is built on his grave. So, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the Roman Catholics, are so busy that they think there's something holy about building a building on top of his grave. There is no power in the remains of Peter. Those are remains, okay? But that's where, where what they do, okay? Um, Mark's gospel is based on Peter's teaching, and Peter eventually wrote the first letter of Peter. Scholars still question the authenticity of the second letter of Peter. A lot of them still question it, but it, it, it lines up with Scripture. It lines up with the Word. And so um, many scholars don't. Andrew. Andrew was originally a disciple of John the Baptist. In Byzantium, he appointed St. Spatius as its first bishop. In Thrace, Pol uh, Peloponnese, Greece, and Epirus, he converted many to the faith and ordained bishops, that's overseers, and deacons for them, or priests, um, some people call them. In Georgia, he entered Georgia from Ahara, preached Christianity in Oxycurri built small church there and left miracle working icon of Theodico. Now, the, the Roman Catholics, they look at um, the traditions and the actual touching of things. Well, the Greek Orthodox and the Georgian Orthodox, you pray in front of icons. So they have a six hour service every week, basically, that you have to go to. Six hours. If not, you are beat to death by the priest in the Georgian Orthodox church. You will pay and you stand in a line, and the procession around the church is six hours, and you have to stand in front of every icon, which is a symbol of one of the, the saints, and you have to pray to it, and then move to the next one. But once a year, the Georgian Orthodox Church, they all bring their animals, and they slaughter so many animals that blood runs down out the temple doors and down the stairs, trying to be Jewish. right and what they're taught 
the tradition. Um, the truth hasn't been brought to them exactly. But like the Georgian Orthodox Church, they are a government-run church. So you have no choice. Um, in England still, most people don't know this, the Queen of England is the head of the Anglican Church. How does the royalty in England make their money? They get all the tithes and offerings. That's how they still make their money. People don't understand that. And the House of Lords are kin to the Queen, and they are the bishops of the church. The House of Commons are elected officials of the people. So uh, the royalty, the Queen of England, she gets her money from the tithes and offerings from the Anglican church. And there are Anglican churches here in America that send her their tithes and offerings to her. Okay? Just so you know. Yes, Gerald? Anglican church is just like the Roman Catholic church, um, except the, 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 the king or the queen is the pope. Okay? Because one of the kings of England rejected the pope's popery, and he became the pope himself. And then there was wars in England over Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. And so if the king was more Protestant, the church would do more Protestant prayers, the Book of Common prayers, not Roman Catholicism. If they were more Roman Catholic, they would reinstitute the traditions of the pope. And a great war went back and forth there in England. Yeah, Shannon. There are, they're called sects, E-S-E-T-T-S. -E there are other free churches, but they still pay their tithes and offerings. It's a law. Yeah. So they would pay tithes and offerings to the queen, a fee, and then they turn around and pay it at their local church. Okay? Plus taxes. So, um, you ought to be happy you live in America. Amen? I'm just saying. So we got to understand um, some of this stuff, okay? Um, so this Andrew, they, they, they hit that, I got on the icon. Um, in the Russian land, the Kiev, he planned a cross on one of the high hills of Kiev. He prophesied a city that would have many golden dome churches and a bright Christian future. <laughs> Andrew was martyred in uh, Peloponnese in the city of Patras in the 62 AD. And um, that right there, the bright golden domes, according to Andrew, is these golden domes that are in Russia. You ever seen Mother Russia, the golden orthodox, the Russian church? And so they say they built that in alliance with his prophecy. So the Andrew is their founder, right? Their patron Andrew. Well, they have a golden dome. That's a Muslim dome. And that Muslim dome is because that is where they said that Muhammad ascended into heaven like Jesus. Even though the center of their faith is in Mecca. And Mecca is the exact opposite direction of Jerusalem. In fact, when they pray, they're supposed to put their rear ends towards Jerusalem. Hmm? But they wanted Jerusalem, so they made sure Muhammad ascended like Jesus from the top of the mount. Okay? Then they put a golden dome on there. So, John, according to John's gospel, 19, 26, and 27, it was probably John who took Mary, the mother of Jesus, as his adopted mother. He preached in Jerusalem and later as bishop of Ephesus. They, they make him a bishop. He wasn't a bishop. He was an apostle. They helped with that church. South of Izmir in western Turkey, worked among the churches of Asia Minor during the reign of Domitian, he was banished to the nearby island of Patmos around 90 to 95 I.D., um, now, now one of the Greek islands in the Aegean sea, or Aegean sea. He was subsequently freed and died a natural death at Ephesus, A.D. 100. Of course, they boiled him in oil. He did not die. He was literally boiled in oil. Jesus said, if you, if you save your life, you lose it. If you lose your life, you find it. And he, he, he's the only apostle that didn't run from the cross. He's the only apostle that stood there while Jesus died. He's the only apostle that took over the, the mother. And so he lived longer than all of them. And he didn't die by martyrdom. He died an old death. Yet they tried to boil him in oil and stuck him on the aisle. Can you imagine that? Being boiled in hot oil like a French fry? Yeah, John. He wrote the book of Revelation, 1 John, 2 John. Okay? And uh, uh, John. And so he died. After decades of debate, many scholars accept that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos 
and he either wrote or provided the material and theology for, for John's gospel and three letters of John. And like these, these letters, um, a lot of them have, there was a person that they would dictate to and the person would write the letter. And sometimes in the writing, at the end of the letter, it would tell you who wrote the letter. Um, but what it was, was John would then start speaking in the Holy Spirit, and just like in the Old Testament, the prophets did spoke, and they had a scribe, and the scribe wrote out what Moses said, or wrote out what, what the prophet said. And that's why by the time we get to Jesus, scribes, they think they're real important people, because they get to interpret what was said. Well, but that's, but they weren't in the spirit, they were just writing. So Philip, Philip preached the gospel in Phrygia, West Central Turkey, before dying or being martyred there in Hierapolis. According to history, Bartholomew was at his crucifixion. In Hierapolis, he killed a giant snake that the pagans worshipped, which angered the pagans so much they crucified him upside down. History says the earth opened up and swallowed many of the pagans. Being afraid, the people rushed to bring him down, but he was already dead. The apo this apostle, uh, the apostle could be distinguished from Philip the deacon or evangelist who preached to the people of Samaria, baptized an Ethiopian. And you find him in Acts 8, 4 through 8, 26 through 39. Bartholomew. The missionary work of Bartholomew is linked with Armenia, present-day Armenia, eastern Turkey, northern Iraq, western I Iran, and India. Other locations include Egypt, Arabia, Ethiopia, and Persia. After assisting Philip in Heropolis, he made his way to India, where there he translated the Gospel of Matthew and cured the Armenian king, daughter of insanity, but the king's envious brother had him crucified, skinned him, and beheaded him. Okay? And... Uh, uh, so Thomas Didymus, Thomas may have been labored for the gospel in Parthia, that's modern Iraq and Iran, but stronger traditions linked him with southern India. Indian Christians from the west coast Karelia area claim they were evangelized by Thomas, who was later speared to death near Madras on the east coast. Mount St. Thomas, close to Madras, is associated with his name. Preaching the gospel earned him a martyr's death. For having converted the wife and son of a prefect of the Indian city of Melapur, the holy apostle was locked up in prison, suffered torture, and finally was pierced with five spears. He departed to the Lord. Matthew. Nothing definite is known of Matthew's career. After preaching in Judea to the Jews, his gospel was probably first written in Aramaic and later translated into Greek. Eventually, Matthew went to Ethiopia to spread the gospel. There he was martyred by Fulvian, the ruler of the region, by being set on fire. After Matthew willing, get, willingly gave up his soul to the Lord, his body was put in a coffin and cast in the sea. Matthias, according to church tradition, because we don't hear anything about Matthias, Matthias except they cast lots for him, okay? But they ought to make something of him. He was preaching at Pauline, Ethiopia, in Macedonia. He was frequently subjected to deadly peril, but the Lord preserved him to preach the gospel. Once, pagans forced the saint to drink the poison potion. He drank it, and not only did he himself remain unharmed, but he also healed other prisoners which had been blinded by the potion. When St. Matthias left the prison, the pagans searched for him in vain, and he became invisible to them. Another time when the pagans had become enraged, intending to kill the apostle, the earth opened up and engulfed them. The apostle Matthias returned to Judea and did not cease to enlighten his countrymen with the light of Christ's teaching. He worked great miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus. He converted a great many to the faith in Christ. The Jewish high priest Ananias hated Christ, and earlier it commanded the apostle James brother of the Lord, to be flung down from the heights of the temple. And now he ordered that the apostle Matthias be arrested and brought for, uh, for judgment before the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem. The impious Ananias uttered a speech in which he blasphemously slandered the Lord. Using the prophecies of the Old Testament, the apostle Matthias demonstrated that Jesus Christ is the true God, the promised Messiah, the Son of God, consubstantial, co-eternal with God the Father. After these words, the apostle Matthias was sentenced to death by the Sanhedrin and stoned. Simon the Zealot. After Pentecost, he preached the gospel in uh, Maranatia in Africa. He ended his missionary work in Georgia. St. Simon was tortured and crucified by the pagans in Abkhazia. James, the son of Alphaeus. He made missionary journeys throughout Judea, Odessa, Gaza, Eleutheropolis, proclaiming the gospel, healing all sorts of sickness and disease, converting many to the path of salvation. St. James finished his apostolic work in the Egyptian city of Ostra, China, where he was crucified by the pagans. Judas, the brother of James, 
After the ascension, he preached the gospel in Judea, Samaria, Galilee, Idumea, Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia, and Armenia. While preaching in the area around a rock, he was captured by pagans, crucified, and killed by being shot with arrows. Paul. Paul traveled widely, made at least three major missionary journeys, journeys wrote many letters, at which 13 still exist. Some scholars dispute three of them. And his life and work is touched upon in a variety of, of ways in his letters. On returning to Jerusalem after his third journey, he was arrested and during his subsequent trials as a Roman citizen appealed to Caesar for judgment, all covered by Acts 21 through 26 in your Bible. Chapters 27 and 28 then describes Paul's voyage and journey to Rome in fascinating nautical detail. Thereafter, his life and death is a matter of conjecture and tradition. For some two years after his arrival in Rome, he was under house arrest before possibly being executed in the persecutions of Emperor Nero that followed the burning of Rome in A.D. 64. If so, Paul's authorship of three of the pastoral letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, can be open to doubt if he died on that day. Okay? A lot of people have him dying later than that. So, uh, you know, and all these are conjecture based on different historical accounts. Okay? Um, however, there are strong traditions that appeal to, um, to the emperor on what was a Jewish religious charge he was acquitted. He remained free for perhaps three years, revisiting Ephesus, other churches, even going as far as Spain, before being rearrested, sentenced to death. In his cell, he wrote his last letter, the second letter to Timothy, before execution around the year 67 A.D. Tradition is that he was beheaded at a place now called Pre Fontaine in Rome, and that the Church of St. Paul stands over his grave. So we have the Roman Catholic Church like going and making a big deal over where these guys die, where they're martyred. They're building churches over it because everybody wants to come see it. It's supposed to be a most holy place, all of these things. What was holy about their lives was not necessarily where they died. If they were martyrs, we know where martyrs are. They're under the throne of God, and they're crying out for judgment on all of those that martyred them, the Antichrist spirit. They are actually under the throne of God, and Nikki, it says in 1 Thessalonians that it's a righteous thing for God to send trouble on those that have troubled you. The tribulation comes upon the earth because of all the righteous people they martyred, killed, destroyed. And when the men of God are raised off of the earth, then the Antichrist spirit moves in full blown. The earth trembles, shakes, and tribulation happens. So you've got to understand these were the beginnings, and all of these men, the original 12, they taught different men in different churches. They founded churches. And after them come writing some real, some fake. And if you don't know the scripture, you won't know what's real and fake. Some things are evident. Um, like I can take you to the book of Barnabas, which was not written by Barnabas. And how you know it's not written by Barnabas is Barnabas was no fool. Barnabas, he, he traveled with Paul. He was there when they baptized. Barnabas knew all the Old Testament letters. And in the book of Barnabas, when you get to the second chapter, they say anybody that wants to be baptized, a pitcher must be poured upon their head of water. And anybody that doesn't have a pitcher poured on their head is not authentically baptized. Okay? So what this is, these fake books that come, this is why you got to know your Bible. The fake books that come, they will make extreme statements that we can see in Scripture clearly go against what, like Philip did, clearly go against um, them baptizing people, immersing them in water, clearly go against that, you know, um, and, and then they say these statements. Also, if you read the book of Quran, which we may go into next, I have a study on that, which is powerful, if you want to go into it, um, but in the book of Quran, the book of Quran is as nuts as one of those heretical books. I'm telling you, it pulls one scripture out, and then it says all this heretical stuff. Like, Jesus was a baby in a crib, and his mama gave him a piece of clay, and he turned it to a dove, and she watched it, watched it fly away. What's the purpose? I guess that represented the Holy Spirit. I have no idea. Then in the next chapter, we see um, if you, it, it's legal to lie to an infidel. It's legal to marry a nine-year-old. And they start, they mix all of this stuff in with, with various weird truths. And then they'll put a truth next to something that's not the truth. That's not how Scripture is. Scripture's not like that. And we're going to go into 
how the scripture was made or, or what it was made. And scripture's nothing like that, okay? I don't go to my Bible and see one place, thou shalt not lie, and in another place, tell a few fibs sometimes. I, I don't see that. I don't go to my Bible, Nikki, and, and see, okay, well, fornication is okay over here, but not over here. I don't do that. I don't go to my Bible and it says, okay, when you defeat a country, the women are infidels, you can rape them as many times as you want and tie them to a tree. That's the Muslim Bible. But they're not they're supposed to be holy men. But if they're at war, they're allowed to tie a woman to the tree, rape her over and over because she's a dog. I have a problem with these things, and you should too. And you have to understand, it's one thing to repent of sin. It's another thing when we start taking sin and turning it to doctrine like it's okay. That's not how this works, okay? So the book's written in the New Testament. Let's go some of these. Okay? These are the dates these books are, are um, estimated to be written. Just so you get a timeline in your brain. Okay, Matthew, 40 A.D. to 60 A.D. Mark, 45 A.D. to 60 A.D. Luke, 57 A.D. to 60 A.D. John, 40 to 65 A.D. Acts, 57 A.D. to 62 A.D. That's when these were written. But the book of Acts, it happened over 30 years. Y'all read chapter after chapter, and you act like this happened in 10 days. Literally, Philip evangelized everybody in 10 days, walked down the street, he did his work, it's over. He's an evangelist. That's about how we treat things. Acts is a 30-year book. 30 years of the Acts of the Apostles. 30 years of establishing churches, amen? So, but you won't read it like that. Y'all read it like chapter 1. You know? On the day of Pentecost, all filled the Holy Ghost the next day. 3,000 people got saved in one day. Everybody comes over here. We build a big church. We, we have a big family. Oh, yes, it all done. Then we run over here. Philip evangelized the whole world. Paul, now he's already in Rome in three days. And this is a problem in the Western mindset because it makes short-term Christianity. Yeah. But it makes short-term Christianity. That's why we have so many people that say they're saved tomorrow and they're doing something else the next day. It's short-term. They don't understand. We're walking this out. Romans 57 A.D., 1 Corinthians 55 A.D., 2 Corinthians 56 A.D., Galatians 49 A.D. to 56 A.D., Ephesians 58 to 60 A.D., Philippians 58 to 61 A.D., Colossians 58 to 60 A.D., 1 Thessalonians early 50 A.D. to 51 A.D., 2 Thessalonians 50 to 52 A.D., 1 Timothy 55 to 64 A.D., 2 Timothy 58 to 66 A.D., Titus 57 to 64 A.D., Philemon 58 to 60 A.D., Hebrews 66 to 67 A.D., James 40 to 49 A.D., 1 Peter 62 to 65 A.D., 2 Peter 62 to 67, 1 John 57 to 90 A.D., 2 John, 57 to 90. 3 John, 57 to 90. Jude, 61 to 65 A.D. And Revelation, 68 to 95 A.D. Why does this matter? Because the Apostle John was the last living apostle. And the Apostle John, when we go to the early fathers, the early church fathers, what they were preachers that were in pulpits, many of them were in a relationship with Apostle John. Polycarp, walked with Apostle John. He was the bishop or the overseer of the church of Smyrna. We're going to go into his, some of his stuff. A powerful, powerful man of God. There was a heretic named Marcion. And Marcion, he, he thought he was a deacon. His father had a bunch of money, so he started opening up a bunch of churches, and they preached heresy, a bunch of non-true stuff. Marcion, in one of the accounts, we'll get it later, but I love this story, He's a heretic, and y'all y'all think Christians are just supposed to be so kind all the time. Marcion was a heretic, and he was leading people to hell. And Polycarp was a great debater. A long time ago, you would go in, and two ministers, they would debate the word and theology of the word and doctrine. And they would try to prove one another 
up right or wrong based on Scripture. Marcion knew no Scripture, and Polycarp was at a debate in front of a church where he, where he was teaching and they were debating because this was the way the Greeks and the Romans did. If you wanted to teach them, you had to debate. They loved science, they loved debate, they loved argument. People didn't kill each other. People didn't leave when there was an argument. They came back for another debate. Somebody had to be right. Nowadays, you know what we do? Oh, many of us can be right. No, the Bible's right. There's only one truth. Everybody said one truth. So Polycarp's debating this guy, and Marcion flings open the back doors of this church, and he has all these heretic churches, and he walks up to the front in this long robe with his guys with him, and he looks at Polycarp right in front of all these hundreds of people. Polycarp's debating. And he looks at him and he says, Acknowledge me, sir, to Polycarp. And Polycarp says, I acknowledge you, firstborn son of Satan. That's what he said. Then later on, Polycarp and John were going by a bathhouse. They had a bathhouse where people would go. They didn't have hot water at home. But the rich and people that were thought to be somebody would go in these bathhouses where hot springs would come up. And... Uh, Polycarp was with John, and they started going to the bathhouse, take a bath, and they looked over, and there was Marcion, and J Polycarp said, should we go in? And John said, I wouldn't step foot in there. You never know. The thing may crumble on top of him. So, you know, we're, we're just so lax with everything. Just accept everything and everybody. That's not how this is. And yet we're ignorant of Scripture. We're ignorant of doctrine. We're ignorant of purpose. Everything God has is a purpose. And if you distort that purpose, it cannot be true. Understand? And so, while all these books were written at different times, we need to understand that the original establishment of early church existed first and foremost in oral tradition. This is so powerful. Nobody was packing a King James Bible, and yet they had so much scripture memorized. And did you know the Old Testament scriptures? They didn't have chapter 1, verse 8. Yeah, yeah, but they didn't have a reference. We all act like Romans 8.32. Ooh, he knows the word. He knows the reference. I'm not real good at references, but I know what the Bible says, and I can bring up the scripture to you and throw out scripture. A lot of times you all think there's because there's no reference in front of it that I'm not referencing scripture. I have scripture going through my mind. And what they would do, they would be writing, some of the early writers, and, and they, they would write, Joel, uh, Javon, where, where's Joel tonight? She's not here. Uh, write, um, write the letter, and they would put somewhere in the book of Isaiah, it says, and they would quote it word for word from memory, like almost a whole chapter, write the thing. And they had it memorized so deep that it wasn't, it wasn't about the scripture reference. You know, it's real irritating when I see someone go, I'm going to take up an offering, Psalms 109.9. Everybody give money, Psalms 109.9. Like Psalms 109.9 has some sort of righteous indi indication to it. If that's the case, then we should just go to every chapter that's 7-7. Seven, seven. And there's a place where... You might, oh, the, this, uh, this is seven, this is seven. The numbers written in the Bible have specific meaning, but the, you know, place to find it, it's a reference. Everybody say a reference. And yet, you've got to start where someone's faith is. A lot of times they're like, I had a girl one time, this blew my mind, Chris, we're in Little Rock, Arkansas. This girl came to the service and she got filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues gloriously it was on a Tuesday night Wednesday night she went back to her church the church was a Baptist church and they told her that's of the devil you can't speak in tongues it's of the devil that's what they told her well, well Wednesday night she, I mean Thursday night she wasn't there Friday night she came she was crying I said what are you crying about she said you told me that I wouldn't find any place in the Bible against speaking in tongues and I found it. It's in my Bible. It's in my Bible. I said, well, show it to me. She opens it up. What it is, is on the left side of her Bible is the Baptist reference. 
with men's writing in the side, their opinion about the text. But she thought because that was in her Bible that all the words written in there were divinely inspired. I'm trying to show you, do you make these mistakes? We might. And what you do is different denominations print the Bible again and again and again with their opinions and they tell you what happens, get rid of it, what they don't want. Yeah, Trevor. Yeah, now there's different things happening with that, okay? Like the King James does that. Did you know that? Yeah. Um, somebody bring me a King James Bible. I, I, I'm going to have one. Let me see. Find one. Oh. I'm sorry. I had a, had a um, flat tire today. I had to get out in the rain. It was laying in the mud and stuff. And it was on the ground and it rained on my head. And then I couldn't get my spare down. It has one of these cranks on it. I could not get it down. And then I finally, an hour and a half later, up and down, called John, who took me from this. I'm a little sore, sorry. I need to go run. Let's see. Okay, come here, Trevor. You have a King James. You can see it. Psalms 119, verse 92. Now, when they take the text from the Hebrew to English, they have to make it a complete sentence. a complete sentence grammatically in our language which can be good and it can be bad because the words they put in there to make it a complete sentence can have a certain meaning or twist so let me show you right here Psalms 92 you read, when you read I want you to read along but unless okay look right there then see that's italics that means, it really says, unless thy law, my delight. Problem is, is they said had been. What? You know, they, they, yeah, and there are different tenses in the Hebrew, right? So they're trying to fill it in. But unless thy law, you could even make it present, but it's probably written past tense. So they did, have been my delight. I should have perished in my affliction. So they're not adding to what they're trying to do, but yet it can change meaning. If you don't go to the Hebrew, yes. Comes in, yes, they did. They did. Like a flood, God, yeah. So it is, instead of making the enemy come in like a flood, right, that is actually a cross-reference to what God did to the Egyptians in the sea. When the enemy comes in, like a flood, God. See? But they did. They put the calm in the wrong place, made it like the enemy came in like a flood. Right? And certain things can get people, oh, the enemy's flooding me. He's flooding me. And they have a scripture reference for it. And then you go over. But the problem is, is when you look at the Bible, everywhere in the Bible, it's God flooding the enemy. God flooded Noah's day. They were flooded. Right? So we got to, and that, it brings us to a point. Okay. Because we found out the comma was put in the wrong place, where in the Bible, where in the Bible, and there is one, there is one, maybe two, but where in the Bible does it reference the enemy flooding us? Because for it to be a truth, to make it doctrine, you've got to have two or three scriptures. Somebody tell me. I can take you one right now. Okay? The Bible says, when I walked through the flood, I mean, walked through the fire, I was not burned. When I came through the flood, I did not drown. Uh-huh. Right. So, so the enemy may try to flood us, but, but scripturally, we see God flooding the enemy, right? And because the comma was put in the wrong place, we know that that's referencing that, making doctrine even more secure. Okay? But if you really want the enemy to flood you and you believe that, go ahead. And if you've got the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. 
And that's it got the Holy Ghost out of your bellies coming rivers. Amen. That's right. You're right. But see, this is the problem. So what they'll do is they'll come over and say, but the Bible says if I walk through the flood, I won't be drowned. Well, that's true. That's a second. So then guess what? If they want to believe that, have fun in the flood. Because the Bible all says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you want to believe that, you go right ahead. I choose to see my God flooding the enemy. Amen? Yeah, Job. Right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Can you give me a scripture reference for making God bigger? Yeah, that's one. Uh huh. That's one. And then there's other scriptures. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Remember a magnifying glass? Whoop! Makes it bigger. Uh huh. Make God bigger. Amen. And that, that's absolutely right. And yet, a more effective way, like if we walked through the flood and did not drown, didn't Israel walk through those waters? They walked up, but they did not drown because they walked through them. So that can be that kind of reference too. And I'm trying to open y'all up to secure doctrine and how people twist it around. Okay? If you are constantly in a state of despair or you think the devil has control over you, you'll go to every scripture. I mean, you'll make the devil powerful. You'll be looking at every scripture out of darkness instead of light. Right? They do. They do. Because of the belief of the heart instead of really knowing God's power to deliver. Okay? So we just hit several things right there teaching you. Um, but they... They literally lived this. This wasn't just something written on a page. They lived it. And when we go into early church history, you're going to find out what they lived. I, I don't even think some of us even realize what they lived as Christians. Okay? So the apostles would become direct orators of the teachings and the doctrines of the early church. As they taught and set up churches, they would teach and also establish writings to specific congregations. Over time, the gatherings of these teachings would become known as the New Testament. The words New Testament come to us from the Latin words Novum Testamentum, first used by one of the early church writers whose name was Tertullian. And by the way, Tertullian was an African out of Africa. And by the way, the African continent had more churches and Christian churches than you can imagine until the Muslims came and put them all in slavery. And the Muslims were the ones that started the first slave trade because the Muslims were the first ones that started the coffee trade. The word coffee, you know what it means in Ethiopian? Black. And it wasn't referred to the coffee. At first it was, but it was referring to the people that brought them the coffee. And later they made the African their slave to pick the coffee. And did you know, how many of y'all have heard of French roast? You know where French roast came from? Well, what happened is, is early on, the Muslims would literally kill you if you tried to take a coffee bush off of their ground that they were over. They would try to kill you. And one day, a Frenchman, he went in there and he got one out. One coffee bush. And so then, when he, he made him a, him a farm in France, and this is French farm. No, French roast. And we get all, all these different coffees from different continents now, right, grown. But it all started with the slave trade, with the Muslims trekking across Africa. They burned and pillaged and raped all the Christians so bad that, how many of y'all ever watched Roots? Ever seen? Okay. Kunta Kinte, he thinks that he is a Muslim. Why? Because he grew up Muslim. If you weren't a Muslim, you couldn't participate in society because of the slave trade. And it was them that put people in chains, bought them, and took them over and sold them to Spain. To the Queen of, Queen of Spain, to England. Okay? We'll go into some theology about that later. But you need to understand. And yet, 
it's so weird. It is weird to me to, I went into a, um, we were in, um, oh man, what's the capital of Alabama? Mobile. When I was in Mobile, Alabama, that was where the South had their, had their capital. I stood on a star where Jefferson Davis was put in as the president of the Confederate States. What's so funny is I can stand on that star, two blocks down on the left is the church of Martin Luther King Jr. where he was raised up to finish the work on slavery, to take us forward. His church was right down the street to the left. If I go another block, the Muslims have paid for a museum. Well, it doesn't change history, but it makes, makes the slave they're like the slaves. So when you go into the Muslim, it's the Martin Luther King, and it starts out and it says, um, rivers of many waters are flowing down, all this stuff, and it's a scripture reference to Isaiah. Yes, they think he quoted that, that he said that. Then you get in there, and we start going through the slave process, and by the time we're at the end, the Muslims are being abused by Americans, and they're standing arm in arm, and they gave $2.3 million to build that. So by the time you get to the end, you see the slaves and you see women in hijabs standing side by side to send a message. But yet the Muslims were the one who put everybody in slavery. It's just really ironic. I'm telling you, well, no, that's to get the idea in your head that they are godly and Christians aren't even though Dr. Martin Luther King was a pastor. Amen? Yeah. Just sitting here taking this as word. So, this phrase came from the apostles using Jeremiah 31, 31 from the Old Testament text, which is where the New Testament came, but they had the Old Testament. But where did they get it? The apostles caught this. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. Okay? So that's where the word New Testament came from. A new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make of the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall... Teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, the Lord, No, the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. When it says not teaching, it's not getting rid of the teachers. What he's saying is he's not going to need your brothers to take you out and stone you. Because when the word of God is on, the, on your own heart, you will be convicted of your own sin. You will come to God yourself. The word new covenant is Hebrew. In Hebrew is Berit Kadasha. It simply means new covenant. The book of Hebrew 8, 7 through 13 uses the same new covenant text as in Jeremiah. The majority of scholars believe Paul was the originator of the book of Hebrew. In the Greek, the words for new covenant are kenos, fresh, new, unused. Daitiki, testament, will, the last will after one's death. That's what these words mean. This was used by the early church as a new relationship with God. When they used New Testament or New Covenant, that, that was what they would use for saved. Are you in covenant? Are you in the New Covenant? Amen. About two centuries later, it was used to reference the collective works of the apostles. Here are some references that show the progression as the early church wrote. Tertullian wrote in Against Marcion. Isn't that funny? Remember that guy's name Polycarp stood up against, I told you? Here he is now, Tertullian, all the way in Africa is writing against him. Okay. In book 3, chapter 14, he wrote, This may be understood to be the divine word who is doubly edged with the two testaments of the law and the gospel. Another writer named Lactantius in the 3rd century in his Divine Institutes book, 4, chapter 20, wrote, But all scripture is divided into two testaments. That which preceded the advent and passion of Christ, that is, the law and the prophets, is called the old. But those which were written after his resurrection are named the New Testament. The Jews make use of the old, we have the new, but yet they are not discordant, meaning they're not, not in agreement. 
for the new is the fulfilling of the old, and in both there is the same testator, even Christ, who, having suffered death for us, made us heirs of his everlasting kingdom, the people of the Jews being deprived and disinherited. As the prophet Jeremiah testifies when he speaks such things, hold the days come, I'll make a new testament. We read all that. So I'm showing you right there, this guy's writing. I, I mean, this is just a little bitty section, and he's already explaining Old and New Testament, okay? And this Lactantius, and then he's using Scripture to back up what he's saying, okay? And this is, is the right doctrine. Now, the Vulgate translation, the first translation actually to come in one book, Bible translation, in the 5th century, used testamentum in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, which also hath made us fit ministers of the New Testament, or testamentum. Not in the letter, but in the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit quickeneth. But their senses were made dull, for under this present day the selfsame veil in the reading of the Old Testament remaineth not taken away, because in Christ it's made void. This is what was written in the Vulgate. Okay? However, the more modern NRSV translates these verses from the Greek, Koine Greek, as such. Okay. Now, the Vulgate was translated from Latin, okay, um, into Latin. And then we had this, this was translated from the Greek, who has made us competent to be ministers of the new covenant, not of a letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the old covenant, the same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. The first person on record who tried to establish a New Testament canon, okay, let's stop right there. Everybody say canon. Canon is a group of books that were doctrinally the same or sound. When we say canon, we are saying these books all line up. Okay? These books all line up because there was a bunch of people writing weird books. And the Bible says, you know, that they think they're anointed or they're Christ, false Christ, come in unaware. They just poured in, poured in. You know, one of the ways they knew when they poured in, Brother Chris, so bad that uh, uh, I think it was Origen. Origen, he was a great debater with the Greeks and the Romans. They would debate for hours. But he had a church. And... Uh, they had all sorts of pagan worshipers come in the church. And a lot of them would bring their books and say, I got the book of Barnabas. I got the book of, you know, whatever they wanted to make up. Well, Origen, they had what they called um, the confession of faith. This is where a confession of faith came in early on in the church. And if somebody said, they, today I want to be a Christian, he would give the altar call, Origen. The only reason Origen was alive was because he was a great debater. And the philosophers loved to talk to him. So Rome wouldn't touch him. But you want to see a church service with Origen? Origen said, if you want to become a Christian today, you have to do a confession of faith before these, these people. They would get up before they were baptized. They would say they believed in Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, the doctrine of the apostles. They would believe in the, um, the one and true church. Okay, Devon, that person that did this, you want to watch what happens? After they confessed it, they dunk them in the water. Okay, As soon as they're done, the Roman guards come from the back, grab them, put them in handcuffs, take them to the Colosseum, and tomorrow they get to fight lions. Immediately, Gerald, immediately, he could not keep any members. And many of them were filled with Holy Ghost in the cell. There was a woman named Perpetua. Perpetua. She was ready to fight the, uh, to fight the lions. And God gave her a prophetic vision that when the lions and stuff was trying to get her, she would climb this fiery ladder. ladder and God delivered her. She didn't feel a thing. And the martyrs that were Christians, they would die singing and smiling. You think the paganists would get in the water? They would get in the water. Yes, Stephen. It is. It is. 
faith and all that? Yes. That's exactly, that's exactly it. But denominations take it, and it means something totally different. You're now approved. No, they were trying to find out if you were real. I mean, you're pretty real if right after you're baptized, you're being taken to the Colosseum. You must really love Jesus. And when we get into this stuff, your eyes are going to be open how lax we really are. We're over here moaning because our bill was late. We're over moaning because our back ached. Because we ate too many Lay's potato chips and we're bloated. Please pray for me, Brother Scott. And so, when we talk about this, okay, um, we're talking about what canon is, okay? So, Marcion, this is a sad statement, Marcion was the first one to put a Bible together in one group of writings. Leave it up to the heretics to get it first. But here's what Marcion believed, and we'll hit some of these things. Marcion, the heretic that Polycarp was still, he did away with the Old Testament, and he made two gods. He preached one for the Jew and one for the Christian. He said, Yahweh is the God that creates the universe and then became hateful and jealous. He hated mankind throughout the whole Old Testament. The new God that Marcion made, New Testament, of the Heavenly Father, revealed himself in the human body, became Jesus. He wanted the church to reject its Jewish heritage, and he means the old God of the Old Testament, and therefore he dispensed with the Old Testament entirely. Marcion's canon, or included scripture, included only one gospel, which he himself edited, one of the five of, of the original apostles' gospel, and ten of Paul's epistles. Sad but true, the first attempt in the New Testament was heretical. Many scholars believe that it was partly in reaction to this distorted canon of Marcion that the early church determined to create a clearly defined canon of its own. The first complete listing of the books in the New Testament was given by St. Anthen Anthen Athanasius in the Paschal Letter. Now you've got this other um, writing, okay? How many of y'all want to take just a little bit more? Take a little bit more? Okay. Well, they, the Jews, everybody wanted to be a Messiah. And so everybody was, and they all, it was a popularity, even though if you claimed to be the Messiah in the synagogue, they would kill you. Okay? So, because that would mean that the Old Testament priesthood was no more, and we're all just going to listen to one guy. So if the priest found out that you said you was a Messiah, you're ready to die. That's why. Tried to throw him off. They tried to murder Jesus, but it wasn't until God said, and he went up on the cross. A lot of them would just be stoned to death. That was the majority way for the Jews. Um, but yeah, different kinds of thinking like that. It gets in there, right? And heresies and stuff like that. So, thank you, Jesus, for the rain. That's much better than the sound of hailstones or tornado sounds. So let's go to scripture to establish canon, to understand canon. What books are real? What books are fake? How, how do we do this, okay? And I'm going to show you this, and we're going to break a few of these down, and I want you to have questions if you have them, okay? Um, according to scripture, Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. So this starts a thing. See, the Bible also has the law which reveals our sin. And the wages of that sin is what? But the law cannot be established by one writer. It had to be established by two or three. And not only that, Bill, this is powerful. They also had to have two or three people say that you did it. So not only the scriptural account, but they had to have two or three people say that you did it, okay? Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three, shall the matter be established. 
So this is precedence concerning our sin. But it's not just relating to sin. It's relating to doctrine. Because God wasn't about killing you for your sin. He was about getting the truth to you. Right? Because the truth will set you free. Matthew 18, 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. I'm talking about church. That's between brother and sister when something's done wrong. Okay? But yet the spirit of the brother and sister is supposed to be for, to forgive and restore. We ain't pulling out stones and stabbing you because you did something wrong. Okay? Um, but you've got to understand this. So 2 Corinthians 13, 1. This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Paul said, I've taught you this scripture once. I've taught it to you twice. This is the third time I'm coming to you. So don't say you haven't heard me say it. It's Paul. So now he's using it in reference of the scripture teaching of what that was, okay? And so how many of y'all, we do this with prophetic words. I think it's funny. Everybody automatically does it with prophetic words. Brother Brown says, Ooh, they said that I'm going to go into ministry. Another prophet comes two years later. You're going to go into ministry. That's two. Two prophets said I'm going to go into ministry. Nothing wrong with it. Three years later, third prophet. You're going to ministry. Whoa, that's three. Three. Right? Brother Brown, I don't have a problem with it. When we get to 30 prophets doing it, I say, would you hurry up and go into ministry? Okay? And so... Oh, but it's like that. And we do that with words, like spiritual words, or God being in the mouth of the prophetic, or something like that. Or, and, but Scripture is the same way. Did you know Scripture is the purest form of prophecy? The Spirit of Jesus is the Spirit of prophecy. It's alive, okay? So you need to understand this, okay? So let's go on. Isaiah 28, 9 through 13. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. You see two or three here. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. And then it goes into speaking in tongues. People don't know this. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing that they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they may go fall backward, be broken, snared, and taken. What he's saying is Israel had the word of the Lord over and over again, but because they wouldn't receive the Holy Spirit, it broke them. The same word that you hear that God's trying to lead you to, if you turn back and you go deep in the sin, it's going to judge you because the enemy will use the same word to destroy you. Okay? So to understand this, um, 1 Timothy 4, 13 through 16. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 16. Take heed of thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Everybody say doctrine. Someone hollering down there. Okay? 1 Timothy 6.3, if any man teach otherwise, consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to doctrine which is according to godliness. Now I hit that because people, what does doctrine matter? I want to go to a church where there's no doctrine. Literally, doctrines of the devil. I was at one church, they sang all night, and the preacher said, whatever you do, we don't preach doctrine here. I said, what do you mean we don't preach? Well, doctrine divides. Doctrine makes people mad. I said, what are you talking about? Doctrine, doctrine is the, the, it's the same word for doctor. So in other words, if I don't preach it to you right, I'm giving you the wrong prescription. That's what it is. You're going to let people stay sick in their sin without giving them the antidote because you don't like what the Bible says. I, I guarantee if I went in the Baptist church tomorrow and I found a sick pastor and said, I want you to dunk seven times in Arkansas River, what do you think the 
what do you think? Do you think that, that, that the ushers would have a problem? He's a nut. Take him out of here. But he'll go right over and be prescribed a bunch of weird stuff from the doctor. But won't even look, and there's a scripture reference for that, okay? So doctrine is very, very important, okay? Um, and here's, the, here's what, what is doctrine. 2 Timothy 3.16, how much scripture? How much scripture? How much scripture? You mean you can't pick and choose which ones you like or don't like? All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for what? For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, or what is right. The word scripture is grafe, and it means that which is written. 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture, and people have a problem with this, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved on by who? You cannot rightfully divide doctrine without the help of the Holy Ghost. Because it was the Holy Ghost that wrote it. Everybody say no private interpretation. Well, Brother Scott, this is what I believe about it. What I believe about it. I, I believe that I can have three wives. Abraham did. Got him in a lot of trouble, too. David did. Solomon did. I believe. I, but Jesus said, didn't he make them male and female in the garden? He didn't say, I made him male with female. He said, male and female. And he puts them together. He didn't go like this. I formed, I mean, Adam would be missing a lot of ribs. <laughs> he would be ribless. That means he'd be really vulnerable. Really. Isn't that weird too? Man has that missing rib. Yeah, proves it. It's so weird. Why didn't he have like five? I mean, I've seen many ribs. I mean, I've seen them. Baby back ribs. I mean, you know, and what he's saying here is Jesus said I made them male and female in the beginning, okay? But the scripture, and so private interpretation means his own, belonging to yourself. Anything that God gives me as doctrine, I have to preach it to people because it is not mine. Stop. I had a, a man come here and he said, you know how much revelation I've got? I've got so much revelation. And I told him, I said, come here and show it to me. No, I can't. It's private. It's private. It's my own. And I said, hold on one second. God's giving you revelation for yourself? That's not how revelation works. Revelation is revealed truth that applies to all. And I said, if you have revelation, you better get in the book before you die. He didn't like it. Right. Well, but he really couldn't. It was all his ideas. See, everything in this book is the same for all of us. It is leading us to a truth. We all don't deal with the same thing, but it's guiding us, right? It's taking us into that truth. So private is idios. I like to say idiot. His own, belonging to yourself. I have a personal heavy revy. My revelation said I can drink all I want and get drunk all I want. Because revelation that comes from God is cleaning up sin and making your life good. Now, if it is God's revelation for everyone to smoke cannabis, you know what we will see? If God's revelation is for everybody in here to smoke more cannabis, what will we see? Yep, but you see that they're doing that anyway. But what, what, what would we see? What would the outcome of smoking cannabis be? Huh? You would see more of the goodness of God. You would see people walking in here mentally clear. You would see health in their body. You would see, you know, and 
the whole thing is, is to do this on every corner. Even like, I've been really fighting Missy because the doctors had me on some blood pressure medicine, some prescriptions, and I took them, and at first they helped with some of the symptoms. But over time, they're not helping me. Blood pressure, it, it just, you know, the blood pressure medicine's making me fat. Let's just be honest. Okay? My body's full of toxins. I'm going to figure out what's wrong. And if it's a root in my soul, it's coming out. If it is something in my eating, it's coming out. If it's in my body, it's going to be healed in the name of Jesus. Amen? Because I'm not going to deal with the symptom. I'm going to get to the root. Because my healing has got to be there. And if God's calling me to the root, I'm going to get to the healing of it. Amen? And what I'm saying is nothing wrong with the temporary. But Jesus ain't temporary. I love that. How many of y'all like eternal security? <laughs> when I say that, somebody says, you believe what says, oh, I'm not talking about that type of eternal security. I'm talking about knowing that God has an eternal, eternal life. He has life that is eternal. He is beyond this, this place. He is greater. His truths restore things. His truths heal. His truths uh, empower. His truths build up. His truths, and they're not always good either because sometimes correction, it will make your hands hang down and the knees feeble. But he said, go ahead and receive it, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Meaning even correction with God is meant for good. Everybody say, praise God. So if God's plan was for people just to go down here and just live on drugs, then we would see them praising God more. Loving each other more. We would see violence going down. We would see their brain to be able to think. You know, people who just smoke that stuff 24-7. I can't even have a, hardly have a conversation with them. Where are you? Oh. What do you want? Are you serving pizza tonight? Well, you got the munchies. I see that. But why are you here? Right? And it's the same thing. That's like me saying the ice cream is what I needed to fix. Ice cream was not the fix. Ice cream was a substitute of not letting God heal something else. Right? And we're all there. And God knows right where we are. That's why we don't judge where people are. We expect God to move them from where they are to the promised land. Amen? I love that. Hallelujah. So the word interpretation is apilosis, to make clear, to expound, to loose its application. So the interpretation of the word it, it should be clear what we're saying. It should be expounded. It should, it should loose the truth to you. Amen? It should loose the truth to you. It should make you go, wow. How many of y'all know about sin? You know about sin? If you know about sin, lift your hand. I love this girl, but do you know... What looses your inside from sin? Jesus, he does. But he does it by a process, and that first step is what? It's a beautiful, what was it? Beautiful step that people sit there and go, I'm not repenting. I'm not repenting. That's embarrassing. I'm so, you know, and they're saying, I'm too bashful to repent. Baby, there's times where you better give up bashful to get your remedy. I mean, I mean, if I had to run naked to the altar to get rid of my sin, I would. Amen? I might scare four or five people, but that's what was required. I'd do it. Amen? I'm that serious. So I don't have a problem with repenting. I want to get rid of it. I want it out of my life. You say, that's extreme. No, I'd be embarrassed. I'd still be, I, but I'd want to get it so bad. There's nothing God can ask me. I want to be free. Amen? Okay. Now, we're going to keep going here. Historical understanding. Within the times of the early church, we find that heretics in their writings had sought to duplicate and have their books read and added to the beginnings of the church. As far as canonized scripture or approved texts, there are several early fathers, father writings that bear record of early lists. And when they say early fathers, these are the people after the apostles that began to write further books on doctrine. Okay? They are not inerrant, but they are trying to follow the will, will and the word of God. Okay? So Origen, both as a theologian and as a prolific biblical scholar, according to Eusebius, Origen was born of Christian parents in Egypt, probably around 185 A.D. 
spent most of his life in Alexandria as a teacher, but he also visited Antioch, Athens, Arabia, Ephesus, and Rome, and lived for a rather long period at Caesarea in Palestine. In the year 203, Origen was appointed by Demetrius, an overseer, to succeed Clement as the head of the catechetical school in Alexandria. For a dozen years, he carried on the work with marked success with increasing numbers of pupils at the school. In 215, however, as a result of the emperor, Caracalla's furious attack upon the Alexandrians, Origen's work at the school was interrupted and he was driven from the city. Origen took refuge at Caesarea in Palestine where he preached in churches at the request of the bishops of Jerusalem and Caesarea as he was only a layman. This was regarded by his bishop Demetrius as a breach of ecclesiastical discipline. So his, his pastor, Demetrius, got jealous of him because he wouldn't even make him an elder and because he didn't ask his pastor's permission to preach in Jerusalem, this overseer got mad. Okay? In consequence of which he was recalled to Alexandria, where he resumed his scholarly work at the school. In 230, Origen traveled to Greece at some church business, and stopping at Caesarea on his way, he was ordained an elder, that word presbyter is elder, by the same friendly bishops who invited him to preach on his previous visit. When Demetrius learned of this, he felt his authority had been flouted and on Origen's return, return, deposed him of his teaching office, excommunicated him from the Alexandrian church on the grounds of irregularity of ordination. In other words, this guy's jealous, didn't want to put him in the ministry, and was mad they made him an elder. And yet, he's a teacher at a college and submitted at the church, but he won't make him an elder. Origen now moved back to Caesarea, where he opened a new biblical and theological school, which soon outshone shone that of Alexandria, where he continued his extensive literary work, as well as preaching and giving biblical expositions almost every day. In 250, during the Decian persecution, uh, that's one of the emperor's sons, killed everybody, Origen was imprisoned, cruelly tortured, condemned to the stake. Although he regained his liberty at the death of the emperor, he died soon afterward, in the year 253 or 254, probably as a result of the torture. In his lifetime, he was often attacked, suspected of adulterating the gospel with pagan philosophy. After his death, opposition steadily mounted. The chief accusations against Origen's teachings are the following, making the son inferior to the father and thus being a precursor of Arianism. Arianism, a guy named Arian, he wrote a ton of books saying Jesus wasn't God. Origen never said Jesus wasn't God. I've read his books. He never said that, but they blamed him for that. Okay? Um, a fourth century heresy that denied the Father and the Son with the same substance, spiritualizing away the resurrection of the body, denying hell, a morally inverting, a, 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 a morally inurbating universalism. Anybody ever heard of that? That's the number one growing church in America. It takes Jesus and takes away doctrine and opens itself up to everything. Speculating about pre existent souls and world cycles, dissolving redemptive history and its timeless myths by using allegorical interpretation. They accused Origen of this because idiots came out of his school. That goes to show that the Bible college is not the answer. They needed to bring them in the church and know the people. But no matter what we do, as much as you know the people, you cannot stop false people. You can't. I'm telling you, there are people I know that started out well, that ended up false, that were my friends. I don't approve of them. Can't help it, though. If they want to be ignorant, they'll just be ignorant. Okay? So, I want to hit this here. Only a small part of Origen's writings has come down to us, but this fills volumes. The ones relevant, uh, re relevant to the New Testament canon are the Principus New Advent, Commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, Homily on Luke. These are writings. Many of their books are gone. That Arius wrote 2,000 books. The Heretic, he wrote 2,000 books. Commentary on the Gospel of John, Commentary on Romans, homilies on Hebrews, homilies on Joshua. One finds in them citations of all the books of the New Testament, though he expressed reservations concerning James, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John. At other times, Origen accepts as Christian evidence any material he finds convincing or appealing, even designating on occasion these writings as divinely inspired. The Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Hebrews, the Acts of Paul. Origen denies the authenticity of these writings. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of the Twelve, the Gospel of Basilides, Gospel of the Egyptians, Gospel of Matthias, and the Preaching of Peter. Those are actual books. You can go read them if you want to. But he's saying that they're not 
even close to Scripture. They're heretical. Okay? Now, when we get to our Bible being t- put together, the first list that really comes out comes out with the next guy who was a- Athanasius. But, but Origen wrote this. Look what he wrote. He gave a first, first list of the New Testament to be put together. I'm almost done. When our Lord Jesus Christ comes, whose arrival that prior son of Nun, talking about Joshua, designated, he sends priests, his apostles, bearing trumpets, trumpets hammered thin. The magnificent and heavenly instruction of proclamation. Matthew first sounded the priestly trumpet in his gospel. Mark also. Luke and John each played their own priestly trumpets. Even Peter cries out with trumpets in two of his epistles. Also James and Jude. In addition, John also sounds the trumpet through his epistles and Revelation. Okay? And Luke, as he describes the acts of the apostles, um, and now the last ones come, the one who said, you got to know who he's talking about, I think God displays us apostles last. Who's he talking about? Paul. And in the 14 of his epistles, thundering with trumpets, he cast down the walls of Jericho and all the devices of idolatry and dogma of philosophers all the way to the foundation. Okay, so that, that's his writing. This is, is deemed to be the first list of bringing these things together um, of a man that actually made a list that would go into the Bible of the New Testament. In the 4th century, during the time of Constantine, the church was rocked by a controversy started by Arius. I told you what that was, that Jesus was not God. Okay, That brings us to Trinitarian statement, which is not in your Bible, but that's what Arius did. Uh, he didn't make the Trinitarian statement. He tried to say Jesus was not part of the Trinity. What in God? Okay, So, Arius was a deacon of the influential church of Alexandria in Egypt. That's the church, I think this is funny, that's the church that Origen was thrown out of. Okay? So then later on, a real heretic comes out, Arius. Arius denied that Christ was truly fully God, arguing from the Bible that only the Father was truly God, the Son was the firstborn of creation. Athens, oh, whatever, Athanasius was his arch enemy and a deacon in the same church. His main disagreement with Arius concerned salvation. We are saved because in Christ, God himself became a human being and died a human death. God became a human to make humans divine. The immortal became mortal to raise mortals to immortality. No mere creature could achieve this but the very word of God. The incarnation of the word is Athanasius' most famous writing and his most celebrated statement of his case against the Arians. His theology was recognized by the Council of Nicaea as being the true gospel of Christ, and as such it's been passed down through the centuries. What you're about to read, therefore, shows the Christian faith that most of us now take for granted being forged in the heat of the battle. Okay? I'm going to hit this. This is just his Paschal letter, and in 367 A.D., this becomes the official canonized that these books line up. Nothing weird in them. They line up. Since, however, we have spoken of the heretics as dead, but of ourselves as possessors of the divine writings unto salvation. And since I'm afraid that, as Paul's written in the Corinthians, some godlessness or some godless persons may be led astray from their purity and holiness by the craftiness of certain men. On my page. Begin thereafter to pay attention to other books, the so-called apocryphal writings. Catholic Church still has those in the front of their Bible, by the way, and they read all the books and say all of them are holy. Okay? Being deceived by their possession of the same names as the genuine books, I therefore exhort you to patience when, out of regard to the church's mean benefit, I mention in my letters, letter matters which you are acquainted it, acquainted. It being my intention to mention these matters, I shall for the commendation of my venture follow the example of the evangelist Luke and say, um, since some have taken in hand to set in order for themselves a so-called apocrypha to mingle them with the God-inspired scripture concerning which we've attained to the certain the sure persuasion according to what the original eyewitness and ministers of the word have delivered unto our fathers. I also, having been urged by true brethren, having investigated the matter from the beginning, have decided to set forth in order the writings that have been put in the canon that have been handed down confirmed as divine in order that everyone who's been led astray may condemn his seducers. And that everyone who has remained stainless may rejoice, being again reminded of that. Continuing, I must without hesitation mention the scriptures of the New Testament. They are the following. 
the four Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, after them the Acts of the Apostles, and the seven so-called Catholic epistles of the Apostles, namely one of James, two of Peter, three of John, and after these one of Jude. In addition, there are 14 epistles of the Apostle Paul written in the following order, first to the Romans, two to the Corinthians, then after one Galatians, following if the one to the Ephesians, thereafter the one to the Philippians, and one to the Colossians, and two to the Thessalonians, and the epistle to the Hebrews, and then immediately two to Timothy, one to Titus, and lastly the one to Philemon, yet further the revelation of John. These are the springs of salvation in order that he who is thirsty may fully refresh himself with the words contained in them. In them alone is the doctrine of piety proclaimed. Let no one add anything to them or take anything away from them. But for the sake of greater accuracy, I add, being constrained to write, that there are also other books besides these, which have not indeed been put in the canon, but have been appointed by the fathers as reading matter for those who've just come forward and which to be instructed in the doctrine of piety, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of Sarek, Esther, Judith, Tobias, so-called teaching, the Dashi of the apostles, and the shepherd, the shepherd, the shepherd of Hermas. And although, beloved, the former in canon and the latter serve as reading material or matter, yet mention is nowhere made of the Apocrypha, rather they are fabrication of the heretics who write them down when it pleases them and generously assign to them an early date of composition in order they may be able to draw upon them as supposedly ancient writings and have in them occasion to deceive Gaulus. So, your Bible being put together was a powerful thing, and yet, you can go find the other books, you can find them. The Catholics hold them all in regard. I think they've got five, six hundred books. They know them too. But what he's saying is some of the early fathers' writings good as reading material. It'd be like, how many of y'all would go to Mardell's right now, pick up every book, and say it was from God? Would you say it's inerrant? Is anybody willing to say that my books are inerrant? Thank you. I hope, I hope not. Without error. That every word Scott Lovett wrote in that book came across clear and that it's without error. My books are not without error. My preaching is not without error. And yet the principles I preach are according to Scripture. The Scripture is without error. But it is possible for people to take what I say the wrong way. It is possible for them to hear me and not necessarily know what I was saying. But it should be impossible for them to deny Scripture. Impossible. I'm a man, but the principles of Scripture are eternal. Everybody say they're eternal. I will tell you that when I write a book, I go through the thing, I, I'm like this is and I give all as much scripture as I can because that's all I've got to prove what I'm saying. I don't believe in one, and people get mad at me because of this, Gerald, and I've kind of decreased it on Sunday morning because most people can't handle it. Y'all are one scripture wonders. And I really believe that. How many of y'all know Glenn Edwards? Glenn Edwards, he's a really nice guy. He took me out to eat and he said, Scott, what is it? He said, they can't handle it. They can't handle what? He said, you get so many scriptures in your messages that they can barely get through the first half. And I said, but if I don't give scripture, how am I to prove I'm not in error? Because in my world, only the scripture proves that I'm not in error. Maybe it doesn't matter to you. Maybe you can go down here and listen to a preacher preach some sort of message with one text and a bunch of gifts. It's a scary thing because I've seen it done and I've seen people led the wrong way and they are out here doing something and I'm talking about even the gifts of the Spirit are subject to Scripture. How we move, how we flow is subject to Scripture. If you are a prophet, you want to give a word? Do you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to have other witnesses. And actually, you're to get other prophetic people, other people in authority, to judge. Because those people that are judging what you're saying should be able to find it where? I come here and say, 
yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, Missy. Get a divorce from Steve Gadd. Fill it in the spirit. Get a divorce from Steve Gadd. Oh, yes. The word says D-I-V-O-R-C-E for you. D-I-V-O-R-C-E. And I'm like, but what did TJ do? He ate too many snacks at midnight. You have no grounds for divorce because TJ ate too many snacks at midnight. Then they go forward with it. They go and find scripture. They bring it back and say, well, we're unequally yoked. My bed, ever since he ate those snacks, is higher, his is lower. Vice versa, yes. But they should have been required to bring three scriptures that said the same thing, right? Because anybody can pull one from it. You can. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Right, and people people do that, you know, but they need to go with the scripture text, and, and I'm trying to give us the whole thing. We don't throw out parts of the scripture, we want the whole. And recently, I, I had a I had a pastor's wife um, in my office right now, and I ought to be praying for her, not saying her name, but I had her come here, and she was determined, she's going to divorce her husband, and they've been in ministry 23 years, and I asked why. He said, because we're unequally yoked. And I said, but you're both believers. You're both saved. You've both been doing ministry. I just think that you should just find him. And I want you, uh, every time you go to the Lord, I want you to say, in the name of Jesus, this pastor's wife and her husband are healed. Amen? Let it rather be healed. You don't spend 23 years working on ministry without consequence, but you can't just go, well, we're just unequally yoked now. That's not how this works. Do you know how many people can be affected? In 23 years of ministry, there he is. But even if there's a lot of hurt, Christ had a lot of hurt. I know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes, and see, and that's part of counting the cost before you go in ministry. I, I want you to think about this. If Christy and I were to go to separate today, how many years do you think that would take? Years. 10, 15, we might as well wait till we're dead. Because this old boy ain't separating. Because you know why? I will not harm the gospel that we preach just because we have, have inner damage or hurt or are going through some pain. I will not. Because there's too many people at stake. I will fight for restoration. I will bend over backwards. I'll kiss her feet. And she'll kiss the feet of Jesus. There is nothing that you can do to me. And I'm telling you this. Even if something happened, even if Christine ran off, committed adultery. Ain't happening. Let her rather be restored and me find out what made her do that. Was it my hair? Was it my stinky breath? Was it because I spent too much time at church? What did I do? What did I do? Were you not nurtured? Did I not love you? Did I not stay your husband because I became an apostle? What is it? Let's heal it. Let's bring it back in balance. You're forgiven. I love you. There is no short work and just flip it. We're dealing with people. By the way, if we went through something like that, how many other people went through something like that? So if we can get it healed, how many people can God heal? A lot. And we ain't going through nothing like that because we're pretty stubborn. Oh, 
Lord, help us. We'd probably argue before we did it. I'm going to go do it. No, I'm not going to do it. You're going to do it? I'm not going to do it. Why aren't you going to do it? Because, I can hear Christine, I'm not doing it. Why aren't you doing it? Because i got a school upstairs, and I'm not leading those children the wrong way. Why aren't you doing it? Well, i got a whole church full of people. We can't do this. This is how we talk to each other. And we tell each other what we're thinking. I'm telling you. I'm in the middle of the night, and I'm like, two gallons of ice cream. Should I do it? She goes, you know you're not going to do it. If you do it, I'll make you run six miles. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Right? No, I won't. Then the next morning, she's like, get over here and drink your juice. It has fresh carrot juice with celery in it to calm you down. Right? Right? Literally. But we, we have thoughts go through. We have things. We want to run sometimes like the apostles ran. We want to we wanna be overwhelmed. We want to do those things. But the cost, do you understand? Too much of a cost, and the cost is not the years of the success of the building. The cost is too many people. Be destroyed, much less my daughters. Amen. So, you know, we need to understand these things, and this is where doctrine is really important. You're going to enjoy this. How many of y'all got something tonight? You have some understanding. Okay. Um, if you want to check out one of these books, come up here. If you're checking it out, I want you to pay um, four dollars to check it out, and then uh, uh, the next person to check it out, they can pay four, and it will pay for the book. Amen. Now I can buy some more. Amen. Maybe we can get enough for a library, and then a bunch of people can go in there. Amen? Um, it's called, this one's called Getting to Know the Church Fathers. Getting to Know the Church Fathers. Okay? And these are the men and different people. Huh? Oh, same way, studying. Um, you go to the old writings and the old historical writings and documents. There's a ton of places online. There are um, different uh, organizations have the original writings in the Greek and Hebrew and it's dated, clear back, stuff like that. But he took all those and studied it, made it into a book about the different individuals. So it's a good, really good reading book. Um, and we're going to be going through this. All right? All right, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for early church history. I thank you, God, that in our times, God, that we are here to stop heresy. We are here because it doesn't work. We are here because your word works. You're the deliverer, you're the strong tower. You have good intended for us. I ask God you would give everyone a hunger here, God, to really get hungry about these things, God, that they would know deep down how these things work and how your scripture, you, and during century after century and, and year after year, you raise up men of righteousness. Make us a church of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Go and be blessed.